It's the week of July 9th, 2018, and you're listening to the Missouri Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Pioneer Field Agronomist Jamie Farmer, and joining me as always is my counterpart to the East, Nick Monning. So this week, today's topic is all about yield protection. If you look at the 2018 growing season, we've made it to the second half. Outside of double crop soybeans, much of our corn and soybean crops have pushed into the reproductive stages, and our focus now shifts to protecting the yield potential that we have out there and what we're starting to set up for harvest. So with that in mind, Nick, what are some of the top tools to consider when it comes to protecting that yield? Okay, Jamie, we're sitting here the very first part of July. We still have a lot of folks trying to weigh that decision on fungicide applications on corn. We had a lot of planes, a lot of helicopters flying last week, putting fungicide on cornfields, even putting some late season nitrogen on. We still have a few folks thinking about whether or not it's the right thing to do or not. And just want to provide a quick update with where we are from the last podcast in terms of disease development. So just in 2018 in general, disease development has been pretty slow. But up until last week, we really hadn't seen much other than gray leaf spot down low. However, that cool down that we had the last 10 days or so before we ramped the heat back up last week, apparently brought in a spore shower of northern corn leaf blight because we started to see a lesion or two of northern corn leaf blight up in the middle to upper canopy that many of the cornfields we started looking in. Northern corn leaf blight, kind of a cool weather disease. It doesn't really like temperatures much above 80. It really thrives when we get in that 80 or less temperature degree range. We have wet conditions. And so this, the end of last week and into this week, the heat is really going to slow it down and pretty well halt it for now. But just realize that if we start to cool down again later in the season, that that northern is now there. So it could ramp back up later if we have a cool down come through. So, Jamie, when it, that's kind of the update with northern corn leaf blight. When it comes to other diseases, what else should we be looking out for? Yeah, good question, Nick. One of the other ones that we've definitely been seeing out there due to a lot of the high humidity, gray leaf spot will continue to advance, especially with the current temperatures in the 90s. It can do some damage, especially on susceptible hybrids. However, it develops much more slowly than northern corn leaf blight. Like you just mentioned, northern can take off in a hurry, where gray takes a little bit longer to build in. Another one to keep in mind would be southern rust. can be very debilitating and aggressive disease in corn, something we've seen the last few years that's moved in. However, as of last week, there had been no reported confirmations of southern rust in the U.S., so we may get lucky and not have to worry about it this year. The 10-day forecast looks like temperatures will hold around 90 degrees for a high and 70s for a low with scattered chances for rain. So the potential is going to be out there for an environment for diseases like gray leaf spot, to be able to continue to thrive. So Nick, when we're considering a fungicide on our corn, is there any hybrid effect that we should also consider? Yeah, it's a good question, Jamie. That's one that comes up a lot. There are a lot of differences when it comes to hybrids and you can utilize disease scores. You can ask your pioneer sales professional when it comes to disease ratings, what the difference between the different hybrids are. But the thing you also have to think about is really think about what's the previous crop, what's that been? Has it been in corn last year? Was it in soybeans last year? You have to think about the tillage type. It's in a no-till environment. Is it a conventional till environment? You also have to think about the location of that field. Is it up on the upland, up on a hill, or is it down in the bottom where the dew usually hangs longer where we have more diseases at? So I guess I tell you that because you can't just go solely off disease scores. A susceptible hybrid may not be the right target, if it's planted out on a drought-stressed hill with no disease pressure, whereas a hybrid maybe that has a great disease package, even though it has that really good disease package, it might be planted in a bottom where we tend to have disease and it tends to, the fog tends to hang low, more susceptible to diseases. So I guess my point to that is don't just utilize disease scores. You also have to think about where it's at, what the previous crop was, if it's corn on corn, um, what the tillage type is, Weigh all that into account, Jamie, before you make that decision on whether or not to apply a fungicide if you're trying to weigh. The other thing, just to think a little bit about, we've done some work up in Iowa. We were looking at fungicide applications over several different hybrids, and sometimes hybrids that have really good disease packages tend to respond the most to a fungicide application versus hybrids that had were really susceptible to various diseases. So 
sometimes those disease ratings can be somewhat a little bit confusing when it comes to yield potential payout. My last point would also, you got to weigh in the yield potential of that field before you make that decision to apply a fungicide to. I guess I just make that comment because the previous couple of years have, have taught me that the higher the yield potential, generally the higher potential payout for a fungicide application. Now, that is if all disease levels are equal. So I'm not saying you always get a bigger benefit, but it does seem that yield potential tends to be somewhat of a driver on what the fungicide ROI is going to be. So, Jamie, with that said, that's kind of the in-depth on corn fungicides where we are right now. What about soybeans? Yeah, with soybeans, we think about where we're at on a growth stage for soybeans. We're a lot farther ahead of schedule, about a month ahead of schedule compared to normal with soybeans. We had flowering going on in some of those earlier planted soybeans as early as the week of June 1. So with those earlier beans, many of them will be hitting that R3, which is the beginning of pod development, close to a month ahead of schedule. R3 is the stage at which one pod in the upper four nodes reaches 3 16ths of an inch length. This is important because this is a stage when we typically target fungicide applications. If you were to look at some of our long-term data at Pioneer, it shows a 2.5 to 3 bushel per acre yield advantage with fungicide applications at the R3 stage. That advantage goes to a 5.5 bushel per acre advantage when we add in an insecticide. So there's a lot of potential diseases that could impact soybeans, but frog eye leaf spot can be the major problem that we usually worry the most about, especially on susceptible varieties. It's something that thrives in these warm, humid environments that we're experiencing, so something that we definitely need to keep an eye out on. So if you were considering a fungicide application in soybeans, Nick, what are a few of the things that you probably need to consider? Yeah, it's a good question, Jamie. So one thing to think about, the overall data, just in general, suggest that soybeans sprayed at R3 with the fungicide, they tend to be a more consistent pair or more consistent ROI than some other crops. You know, we talked pretty in depth about corn. We've seen some big payouts the last couple of years, but just as a general trend, soybeans tend to be a more consistent provider of an ROI when it comes to fungicide applications. Other thing to think about if you're trying to decide whether or not to include a fungicide application over your soybeans, you also need to be sure to consider crop rotation You know, there were quite a few bean-on-bean fields this year. We saw a lot of things like Rhizoctonia, which were getting seedling soybeans early on, and it was mainly, or I should say, worse in soybean-on-soybean fields than it was on rotated fields. That's going to be the case with other diseases as well. We're going to have more inoculum there and that soybean residue for it to infect those soybeans. So consider that before you uh, make a fungicide application. And then also think about the fact that there is frog eye resistance to the strobulin class of fungicides. So if you apply a fungicide on your soybeans, you want to make sure it also contains a triazole class of fungicide as well. A lot of dual mode of action products out there, things like Approach Primo would be a good product to put on over the top on soybeans. So, hey, Jamie, what do you think about throwing the insecticide in with the fungicide at this stage? Yeah, so like we mentioned, the data suggests that uh, throwing the insecticide in, long-term data suggests it's a better ROI for its initial cost than the fungicide. Um, With defoliation from Japanese beetles taking effect in some of those areas that have been seeing the pressure from them, a lot of folks are likely going to add the insecticide. If you do, which the data suggests that you should, uh, just a couple of things to remember with that. The residual for most pyrethroid insecticides that we're likely going to use won't last much more than a week or so. Japanese beetles are very mobile, uh, so once that wears off, they're likely to come back. So just be aware of that. You get an initial knockdown, but then, you know, got a lot of potential for those Japanese beetles from neighboring fields and other areas to move back in. Also, if we turn off hot and dry after your insecticide application, you could see some spider mite flare-ups due to the removal of the beneficials. There's a couple of things that help us keep spider mites at bay. One of them is beneficial insects, and another is a fungus that's out there that will attack spider mites. So it's typically a situation where we either rely on the insects to help manage them, or we definitely rely on the rain and bring an environment for that fungus to help us manage spider mites. So not trying to deter you from using an insecticide with your fungicide. Long-term data suggests that that's going to help you increase your ROI. Just something that we wanted to make sure you understood that if you use it, 
be aware that you need to be the lookout for spider mite issues, particularly if we continue to stay hot and dry. So with that in mind, Nick, are there any other key topics that we need to keep in mind of for this week? Yeah, I guess, Jamie, one other thing to think about, as much as the corn has pollinated it or is finishing up pollination right now, it would be evaluating success of pollination. So just cutting those husks back or the shucks back pretty gently, take your pocket knife, cut down the side of that, just gently peel those shucks back until they're all the way off, but do that without ripping the silks. And then you can just take that ear and shake it. And if those silks fall off, then that's pollinated. Uh, for some of the stuff that may be pollinated there at the end of last week, you can probably tell right now it's got a blister on it. So if you peel that back, you'll be able to see the, the kernels that are developing. So just evaluating that pollination success, I just bring that up because there was some severe stress on certain fields. We're seeing some ear oddities, you know, some ear pinch. We're seeing some missed kernels on the ear butts uh, where we went through some severe stress. So it might just be be mindful of that right now and take a look and evaluate where your field's at in terms of pollination success. Excellent point, Nick. Something to always keep in mind uh, when you're out there evaluating how well that corn is pollinated. One of the other things that we wanted to mention is, you know, we're talking a little bit here. We're, we're ahead of schedule on corn and we're ahead of schedule on soybeans. You know, talked a little bit there about the fact that we're a month ahead of schedule uh, compared to normal on our reproductive stages for soybeans. A lot of that comes back to the heat that we built in there early. If you were to look at Pioneer's GDU calculator and some of the forecast projections, we're 400, around 400 GDUs ahead of schedule right now. So with that in mind, thinking ahead to harvest and some of the logistics that we're gonna manage there, there's a lot of potential for us to possibly be harvesting soybeans and corn at the same time in Missouri. A lot of things are gonna be ahead of schedule. So keep in mind that uh, for those of you that use the calendar as kind of your guide to Uh, when you do certain uh, management decisions, certain management tools that you utilize in the field, like like a fungicide or uh, looking ahead at silage chopping and things like that. A lot of that stuff is going to be ahead of schedule than normal when when you're looking at that calendar this year. So keeping that in mind is something that's also going to be important. So with that being said, we thank you for your time and we thank you for your business. Thanks for tuning in this week. Nick, it's always important. uh, If folks can't find us in the field, where can they find us? They can find the podcast at podcast.pioneer.com. They can look us up on Twitter. I am at Nick Monty. And I'm at the Jamie Farmer. And always reach out to your Pioneer sales professional for any other agronomy tip. Also reach out if you want to get signed up for the Walking Your Fields newsletter. Get signed up for email updates whenever we have a new podcast come out. So again, thank you. Thank you for listening and thank you for your business. And we look forward to speaking with you again.